Hello, Trenton Clark with the Virginia Asphalt Association. And now we're gonna cover chapter five, which deals with mat and joint compaction. Here in the asphalt field level one class of VCAP. So as we talk through this module, as we talk about mat and joint compaction, what are some of the things that we're trying to get across to help you understand? One, what is the importance of compaction? Why does it matter? that we get proper mat compaction and we get the density that's required on these mixes. Need to recognize those influences that are outside the operator's control as well as what's in their control. So what can they do to adjust to make sure they get compaction? So we're gonna go through that whole process. We're gonna learn about what influences roller pattern, roller speed. We're gonna learn about the best practices as we go through rolling up against a confined joint for the longitudinal joint and how to cre create a smooth, compact, transverse joint. So we're gonna go through all these different learning objectives. So let's talk about compaction importance. You're gonna hear this over and over, but why do we need to make sure we get proper compaction? Well, there's two goals. One, it helps develop the stability, the rut resistance of the mix to make sure it doesn't deform so we don't end up with things like ruts that lead to hydroplaning. But it also is done to create smaller air voids to the point that we don't have them being interconnected where water and air can go through the mix. And when water and air go through the mix, it leads to uh, oxidation, means that binder gets hard and it cracks, and it also will lead to Stripping, water's trapped in there, it may remove the asphalt from the rock, as well as we get into some freeze-thaw cycles. Again, when water freezes, it expands. Compaction is the final stage of the paving operation. So when you start at the very beginning, coming from the plant, as we go through the tacking, the milling, paving, compaction is the last chance that we have to make a long-lasting, durable surface. So we're gonna go through that on why it's important to make sure we get that long lasting payment for the taxpayer. So as we go through this, one thing you gotta keep in mind, again, this is the last stage, getting uniform pavement, making sure it's properly tacked, making sure we've got enough compaction impacts so many things. Adequate compaction increases the fatigue life. How's that? Because once you get it compacted, you keep those air voids out, that binder doesn't oxidize, it doesn't age as quickly, therefore it has more uh, resiliency, it has more life in the binder, so it's not as prone to crack as quickly. So it's got longer fatigue life. It decreases rutting because we've got those rocks in that mix locked together so there's nowhere else for them to go. They're compacted into that spot. Reduces that oxidation. If you, air can't get in, then it can't age the binder. If the age, binder doesn't age, it doesn't crack nearly as quickly. Moisture damage. We want to keep not only the air out, we want to keep the water out. So if we do that and get the compaction, longer life. Strength, stability, decreases our low temperature cracking. All these are the reasons why we spend so much time stressing the importance of making sure we get compaction, making sure we get the density on that pavement. And we gotta make sure that we're able to get it. <clears throat> the air void content, so we talk about density, we talk about air voids. At the end of the day, they're related to one another. If we say it has 95% compaction, it's got 5% air voids. 92% compaction, it's got 8% air voids. What studies have shown over time, and they vary depending on uh, the types of mixes and the scenarios, basically every time your air void content increases to the point that they then all become interconnected, you lose life. For most of our surface mixes, we have a target. Now it is 92 and a half across all of our dense graded mixes. And at 92 and a half and higher, 
those air voids aren't interconnected. But as soon as you get down to 91 and a half, 89 and a half, every time we step down, that opens them up, more air and water can get in, and we decrease the life of that mix. A study that was done many years ago in Washington State said for every 1% increase in air voids, it's a 10% decrease in life of that mix. So that's why it is so important. What are those effect factors that affect compaction? Well, there's environmental factors, there's mixed properties factors, there's construction practice factors, all of these things weigh in. So what's under the control of the operator? What's not under the control of the operator? The operator can't control the environment. So whether it's a hot summer day or, or a cool fall evening, it is what it is. They can't impact wind speed. Is it a still day or is there a lot of breeze? How much sunshine? Are we paving at day or are we paving at night? All those things impact how compaction is achieved. The operator can't control it, so the rolling has to take that into account. They don't impact the mix. So the mix that's coming out there is one that's been designed, one that's been approved, but if you're using a stiff binder, like a polymer modified binder, <clears throat> or a neat binder, like a 64S22, they compact differently. The aggregate shapes are different. Again, the roller operator doesn't control that. What do they control? What does the crew have? Size of rollers, speed of rollers, number of rollers, number of passes, it's under the operator's control. Production, are we keeping it smooth? Or are we getting trucks in a timely manner that the whole operation is never stopping? How about the site conditions? Is that under their control? Sometimes. But, you know, if you've got a very weak pavement, that changes. Proper lift thickness. If we need two inches, what are we paving? So is that thickness the same? Not something the roller operator is controlling, but that paving uh, crew is controlling. So there's a lot of different things that go into getting compaction. So there's a, it's not just as easy as sitting on a roller and going back and forth. A lot of different factors come into play. So what type of rollers do we have? We have static steel wheel rollers, typically three drums, no vibration. We have pneumatic or rubber tire rollers. We'll have static or vibratory drum rollers. So we'll sh show you pictures of that. That's one of the most common ones we have here in the state. And then there are some combinations where you have rubber tire on one side and a steel wheel on the other. So let's talk about that static steel wheel. Typically you will see these either as a two or a three drum. Static just means we're not vibrating. So we have a vibratory setting on the rollers. If we're rolling it in static mode, the vibratory is turned off. So that can be a two wheel, as you can see in the picture, or you can have a big drum in the front and two smaller drums in the back and vice versa. Again, they're not vibrating. So all the compaction is coming from the weight and the size of the roller spread out over that contact area between the drum and the pavement itself. So we have the static. We have a pneumatic or a rubber tire. So as you can see in this picture, you can see we have tires and we adjust uh, the tire pressures to get the compaction. We see this more in other states, but we do see these in some projects here in Virginia. Typically, they're used in the intermediate. So we have a breakdown, which is your first set of rollers, and then you have your intermediate and finish. This is usually done right after that initial breakdown. But you'll see these uh, pneumatic tires. You'll see it out on cold recycling. Uh, you'll see it on certain projects where it's called for on most paving projects. It's not specified, but it is still an option to the contractor. Then we have the vibratory static roller, which it could be that same roller I showed a couple slides ago, but now those drums will vibrate. 
We also have oscillating rollers, so it looks just like the one on the screen, but the way that those drums, it's not a vertical up and down vibration, it's at an angle to knead those mixes together. And again, these rollers all play different uh, functions in the compaction process. So we have a breakdown that's typically done in the vibratory mode. We can have intermediate, which could be either a double drum like you see on the slide or a pneumatic that again can be run maybe in partially the vibratory and then static. And then we have a finish roller that's always done in the static mode. That finish roller is getting that final compaction, but it's also getting rid of the roller marks. So as we compact the mat, so the paver goes by, the paver screed gives us the most compaction. Depending on the type of screed, you can get mid to upper 80s of your percent compaction. So the rollers are getting the rest of the compaction, again, to get you up to 92.5% or higher. We're trying to do this when we can get the rollers behind the screed to take advantage of the temperature. A lot of times now, advantage of those warm mix technologies with those breakdowns to get more of the density. So we want to take it from the mid to high 80s up into the low 90s pretty quickly right behind the screed. But what we want to make sure we're not doing is getting on it when it's so hot that it's causing the mat to squeeze out. Maybe the mat's tender, maybe it's just too hot. So there are times, depending on the time of year, do you run close to the screed or far away from the screed, depending on temperatures. So we're watching from tenderness and we're making the adjustments appropriately. So what are those five key steps to compaction? First and foremost, paver speed. Are we going slow, slower, more compaction? So that screed is heavy as it's coming behind the paver. So the paver is pulling it along. That screed weight is pushing down. The mix is at the hottest point. So we're going slow to get more uh, compaction. If we go fast, we get less compaction. We got breakdown rolling. So that's right behind the screed. It's typically two passes of a breakdown roller, sometimes three, but it depends on the operation. You have the immediate or the intermediate rolling that comes right behind the breakdown. So again, here's where you're doing maybe from that third or fourth pass to maybe five or six, whatever it may take. And then you finish it off with the finishing roller. It's typically a smaller roller. You're getting minimum compaction you're not really doing the same level of compaction that the paver gives you or that uh, breakdown roller gives you. You're getting rid of those matte imperfections, maybe some of the roller marks, but that's the last thing to give you that appearance. And if those first four don't give you compaction, traffic will. And we don't want traffic giving us any of that compaction. So we're making sure those first four steps are done properly. So I talked about the phases of rolling. We want to keep this in mind whether we're doing it uh, transverse, longitudinal joints, how we're going about it. Uh, the rolling is generally done. You pull off a joint, a transverse construction joint. Once that paver gets going, you, you concentrate on getting the transverse joint compacted. Then you start moving toward the longitudinal joint because again, we're trying to get that material over there, get it compacted to keep, keep joint life. And then we work our way into the mat itself. I want to stress this isn't per VDOT spec says thou shall have to do it this way. This is what the typically on a paving project, the order of rolling is because what we're trying to achieve is a smooth transition at our uh, transverse joint, proper compaction of our longitudinal joints, and proper compaction of the mat. And that's what we're judging on is how smooth that transition is and what are our density results. So as we go through it, when we think about breakdown rolling, we have a rolling zone. So we're really trying to get that 
first roller on there as that paver goes by and start getting that initial compaction when that mat is at its hottest temperature. Whatever it may be, we want that roller on there. Typically, we're not running right up to the back of that paver. So as you can see in this diagram, there's about a 50 foot buffer. That distance will vary depending on your outside temperature, what you're paving on temperature. Because if it's cooler outside, what you're paving on is cooler, it's gonna pull the heat out of the mat faster. So that paver may very well, I mean that roller may very well be closer than 50 feet. But you have to make sure you don't hit the paver screed for safety. Typical paving zones, about 250 feet from the back of the paver screed to where that roller, so it keeps working that area. And as the paver moves down the road, it moves with it. Next comes in the intermediate. Final thing comes in is the finished roller. When you're looking at rollers, some of the things that keep in mind is speed, how quickly. So based on your roller type, if you're in the breakdown, the intermediate, or the finish position, how fast should you go and what is that range? Keep in mind, the slower you go, more compaction you get. The faster you go, you get less compaction. So that's why you see ranges and not definite numbers because it varies based on project to project to project. Roller speed in and of itself. If the mat is cooling quick, you're going to have to be closer. You might have to slow down the paver. You may have to bring in more rollers. You may have to use larger rollers with wider drums to get compaction if that mix is cooling quickly. And again, you see that more on uh, when you're paving in the spring and the fall. And if you're having to do those paving in the evening or at night, your mix cools quicker. A hot July day is a completely different animal so that impacts how you go about paving to get your compaction. You never want to stop your rollers on a fresh mat because it's still hot and what will happen is you'll leave indentations and you're not going to be able to get those out. So let's think about as we're doing our keys to compaction what do you need to keep in mind? Hotter the better for getting initial density. If that mat is not tender, getting on it soon to get the compression to push the air voids out is very important. We want to make sure there's smooth stops and starts. So the roller operator is going backwards and forwards. One, they're not stopping on the mat. And if they do, they're turning but they're not abrupt because if they're abrupt, especially when that mat is, mix is still warm, it's going to create a little wave in the material and it's going to create a hump that we're not going to get out. So we're speeds, we're turning, stopping at angles and going back, angle turns, we're not stopping on the mat sitting there, we're not putting water in the drums sitting on the hot mat, we're getting off on a cooled mat. All these things go into play to giving us not only compacted mat, but also a smooth mat because we don't want the rolling to induce roughness. And the last thing to keep in mind is that cessation temperature. So overall, at 175 degrees, that's when we stop getting compaction. That mix, that binder has cooled to the point that we're not getting any more compaction and if we get on that mat and we try to get additional compaction and we're at 160 degrees, what we're going to end up doing is damaging that mat because now it's too cold to go together. So keep that in mind. Some of the key points to compaction. So now let's talk about joints, whether it's a transverse joint or a longitudinal joint. Transverse joints matter because of smoothness. Longitudinal joints really matter because of the longevity of the mat itself. So let's look first and foremost at that transverse joint. So we're starting to pave and we pull off. 
So we need to make sure that that transverse joint is in good shape. And as we get going, we need to make sure that longitudinal joint is straight, is compact. For the transverse joint, we look at the thing called ACI-1 or the Asphalt Concrete Overlay Transition. Basically, how far, whether it's a tie-in to an existing pavement, it's a tie-in to a joint, if it's a tie-in to yesterday's paving, how all that blends together. The details of that is covered in Asphalt Field Level 2, but we want to make you aware of it because that does impact how you go about tying in and the length of your transition. So let's start first with that transverse joint construction. So we're at the beginning or the end of a project. We could be at a bridge or we could have that transition because we're paving for multiple days and we've got temporary construction joints at the end of each shift. So at the end of each shift, we need to put in a joint and then the next day come in, start pull off that joint and keep going. So we want to make sure that they're smooth. We want to make sure that they're straight, that they're cleaned that they're tacked properly. We have enough tack there to make sure that we get the compaction that we need. We take off properly and we've got them compacted. A lot of steps to make sure that our transverse joint is proper. As you can see, here we have two different approaches. The one we're working parallel to the transverse joint so you can see that roller is going across both lanes. The reason being is that drum now is partially on the hot map, partially on that existing map. That works wonderfully if traffic will allow it. But a lot of times you get into some situations because of the traffic control, you can't go parallel. So then you have to work it just like you would paving the main line where you're going perpendicular or length of traffic and again you're trying to roll in place a lot of times that's dictated by the amount of traffic you have on the road and the type of access so that's a project by project decision that needs to be made and again discussed prior to paving when we get the longitudinal joints what are those keys that we Again, need to be aware of, are we tacking the joint? Do we have that end gate down and that proper overlap? We'll talk about that. Do we have excess material at that joint for compaction? We don't want to starve the joint because if we starve the joint, then we don't have enough material, not enough material, not enough compaction. The joint doesn't last as long. Proper looting at that joint. And then of course, rolling it. So a lot of things going to play before we start compaction. The things you need to keep in mind is what type of edge do you have, what type of longitudinal joint. Is it confined so we're pushing against something or is it unconfined? And just a couple of examples. Here you can see we have unconfined edges. Another one where we have one confined edge and no confined. So if you're doing a mill and fill, you're confined. If you're doing a straight overlay, there's nothing holding it. How you roll it does impact it. So as we look at our longitudinal joint compaction, we need to make sure that we're getting that density so that at the outside as well as at that longitudinal joint, we have life. By specs, we don't say how it is to be done. What we do say is you roll toward a confined edge. If you don't have any confined edge, then you're rolling up slope. So toward, if you got a crown on the road, toward the crown, super, you're going uphill to keep from squeezing it out. But we do have best practices. We do have best practices as far as how far to stay off that first pass, the longitudinal joint, about six inches, you create a hump of material and then you squeeze the next one back into place. We don't want to roll just from the hot side or from the cold side because we don't want to induce cracking and we don't want to cause it to split out. 
So just a couple pictures. Here we go. We got the unconfined joint. We got the drum hanging over about six inches. And what that tends to do is with the forces, it pushes it down. So that's typically the preferred approach for getting compaction initially on that longitudinal joint. Because again, you're trying to seat it all together so it doesn't squeeze out. What we found, if you stay off that unconfined edge, what will happen is you may induce a crack. Maybe a large crack, it could be small cracks, but what may happen is that drum basically cuts, causes it to crack, and it squeezes out. So that's typically not the best approach to do it. Nor so if we put it right on the edge. Again, the nature of the mix, the nature of how all that goes together, you put it right on the edge. What we've seen is that you will squeeze it out. You'll make it tender. You'll take a 10 and a half foot lane and maybe make it 11 feet, or whatever. You've increased the width. So while our specs don't necessarily say this is how you should do it or you must do it, over time we have found these to be the best approaches, which is allowing that drum about a six inch overhang on an unconfined edge. But again, at the end of the day, we don't want to do undo cracking displacement of that mix at that joint. So the contractor is responsible as an inspector, you're ensuring we're not getting cracking and we're not squeezing it out. What do you do if you have a confined joint? So different scenario, you've already paved one lane or you're doing a mill and fill and you're paving back, what are we trying to achieve? Again, we want to roll toward that confined joint and then we want to squeeze it into place. So as you can see in this diagram, we're about six inches or so off the, that confined joint. So if you can just picture in your head, you're going to have this ridge about six or so inches wide of material that's not been compacted right where the joint is. Your second pass, so you go down, you leave six inches, you come back, you push it into place. So now you've got that material in that six or eight inch wide area. You can't go to the left because you just made a pass. You can't go to the right because it's confined. You're squeezing into place and you're increasing the density in that location, which is what we're trying to achieve. And what you'll also notice, there's a little bit of a gap from that hot mat to that cold mat in that bottom picture because we have a little bit of excess material there. Remember, we don't want a perfectly smooth joint. You want to be able to fill it, and that's because you've had a little extra material there to squeeze into place. We also need to make sure that we're getting compaction up against a curb and gutter. Don't put it on vibratory mode and take a chance on damaging that curb and gutter. Making sure you're going slow enough to compact it. A lot of these rollers, the drums are offset just a little bit. So the roller operators make sure they're rolling in the static mode right up next to that joint. I mean right up next to that curb and gutter, but they're not busting it up. So in summary, when we look at mat and joint compaction, again, this is the last opportunity to make or break that pavement. If you don't get compaction, we don't get life. If we do it wrong, we can make it really, really rough. So we need to make sure we take both those into account as we go about it. Compaction determines long-term performance for the mix and the placement of that pavement it has to go into place. A poorly compacted longitudinal joint allows water in it. Once we get water in it, it starts to crack it potholes, it comes apart, and now we have premature maintenance. So that's why we stress proper joint compaction. And at the end, we want to make sure that transverse joint, whether it's the beginning, the end, at a bridge, or in between, is smooth and we don't have a bump or a dip because the traveling public will remember if it's a poor ride. So with those things, we've covered all the basics of longitudinal joint compaction, transverse joint compaction, mat compaction. So look through your knowledge check questions.
and good luck.